also being live streamed. So just uh, adjust your camera and your audio and stuff like that accordingly. Uh, so yeah, we are recording and we're also live streaming as well. So just be aware of that. Those of you who just joined us, thanks for joining. Uh, we're, going, we're going to get started momentarily. Thanks again. All right, I say I think we're gonna get started now. It's a 4.03. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, those who joined and I'm sure others are gonna join. Um, but thanks again for uh, joining us for this webinar. A uh, few housekeeping items before we begin. First, uh, this is being recorded and live streamed. So uh, please adjust your camera and also um, your audio accordingly. Also, we're gonna take questions at the end. 
So uh, we're not going to take questions during, but we'll try to get to as many questions at the end. So as you hear the talk, as you hear the discussion, I want to encourage you to type in a question in the chat and we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Also, I think everyone would appreciate that this is for educational purposes only. Uh, the presentation is not designed to diagnose, treat, or anything like relating your specific health condition. Please speak with a healthcare provider before applying any of these things. We have two main, uh, three organizations are putting this on. Uh, I'll share with two of you. Uh, I'll share two of them right now, and then one after we pre uh, share, present, uh, introduce the presenters. So first, uh, it's Lifestyle is Medicine, which is a non-for-profit organization that puts on lifestyle medicine programs in the Toronto area. Also, Pathways to Hold Lifestyle Medicine Clinics is a naturopathic and lifestyle medicine clinic that services the Toronto area. If you want to learn more about these organizations, the email or uh, the websites are on the screen for you. Today, we're addressing a very important topic, a critical topic, uh, which is cancer. And uh, if you were to list a bunch of chronic diseases and ask people to choose which disease they would not want to get, cancer would probably be on top of the list, maybe competing with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so today we're gonna to explore the scientific evidence that suggests that lifestyle factors and uh, specifically nutritional factors may actually play a very critical role uh, in cancer prevention and even managing cancer in certain ways. And to help us dive into this topic and unpack this, we have two individuals who are eminently qualified to speak on the topic of cancer, nutrition, and lifestyle medicine. I'm gonna introduce them at this time. First, we have Dr. Zara Kassan. Uh, she is a radiation oncologist and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. She is also board certified in lifestyle medicine. Uh, we also have our good friend, Michelle Fideli, who is a registered dietitian who practices at the Stronach Regional Cancer Center in Newmarket, I believe. Uh, she sits on several provincial oncology committees with Cancer Care Ontario. Also, uh, these two individuals are quite the visionaries. Uh, they established a non-for-profit organization called Plant-Based Canada not too long ago, which seeks to spread the message of whole foods, plant-based nutrition to the public and health professionals. Plant-Based Canada puts out resources and videos of talks given by health professionals on the benefits of plant-based nutrition, and they're all for free. They also, do, they also do events, which you can learn about by going on their website. I personally believe that this organization is really poised to radically change the whole landscape of Canadian healthcare. I wanna encourage all of us to really uh, keep an eye out on uh, this organization. So Dr. Zara and Michelle, welcome to Last Time My Life. Thank you, thank George. You. Thanks everyone for joining in. Yes, thank you so much for inviting us. This is a fabulous webinar series you have here. Thanks, you know, just to get started, you know, um, my brother wanted me to uh, just say a thanks to you, Dr. Zara, because when we were first try to get into lifestyle medicine space. We reached out to a bunch of people and you're one of the first people that really reached out back to us. So we want to really thank you for kind of integrating us into the, into the group in a little way. Oh, thank you so much. And you know, before we get into to the topic of cancer, you know, just, I just want to uh, discuss, you know, plant-based care, the organization. And, um, you know, for many organizations, you look at their name and you have to kind of uh, go further to find out what they're really about. But for Plant-Based Canada, I think the name says it all, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> we, wanted, we wanted to make it evident. And also with our logo, we wanted it to be um, all encompassing because we're our whole goal is to educate uh, and have evidence-based on, evidence on nutrition and disease uh, prevention and in the environment. So hopefully yeah, well, you can see that. <laughs> What struck me was that the name is, almost sounds like a vision. It's like the name is the vision. Is that correct? Or? Yeah, that, that's great, yeah. George. Yes, yeah. thank you for that. Yes, that's exactly what we were hoping for. Right. Well, I would encourage everyone to kind of keep tabs on Plant Based Care. I think it's a very intriguing organization, and uh, I think it's, a, it's poised to do great things. Well, you know, we are discussing cancer, and, um, you know, I think the very first question, I think, is, we all, I think everyone understands that cancer is growing, but I think the possibility of most of us getting cancer kind of looms over most of us, doesn't it, Dr. Zara? Absolutely. It's a huge problem at the moment. 
Uh, unfortunately, one in two of us will get cancer in our lifetime. One in four of us will die of it. Um, our biggest cancers at the moment uh, that account for 50% of all cancers are lung cancer, bowel cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. And our two biggest killers, as you know, are two uh, causes of premature death. So that means death before the age of 70 are cancer and cardiovascular disease. And unfortunately now in Canada, cancer has overtaken cardiovascular disease and is our, number top, is our top number one uh, cause of premature death and accounts for one in every three deaths of Canadians. So a huge problem. The good news is, as you've already alluded to, that lifestyle uh, changes um, can impact our risk of getting cancer in the first place. And also if we have a diagnosis of cancer, of reducing the risk of recurrence, reducing the risk of dying of cancer. And if we can institute some of those lifestyle measures, for example, if we can eat well, we can exercise, maintain a good body weight, those three factors, uh, by doing those three things, we can uh, eliminate one in every three cancers that arise. And when we talk about healthy eating, we all know for cancer and for every other chronic disease, the nutrition, which is the most optimal for good health, is a diet that's rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. We we'll definitely want to get into that, uh, but um, before that, can uh, I think a lot of people know that cancer is kind of these abnormal cells that are kind of growing and they form a tumor and so forth, but I don't think a lot of people really realize how those cells actually became abnormal. Um, can you maybe uh, dig, that, dig a little into that for us? Absolutely. So, um, George, that's perfect. So, this um, infographic uh, shows uh, the three stages of cancer development. So that is initiation, promotion, and progression. So initiation is when you get uh, DNA damage, and that's what's happening uh, all the time, constantly in our body. And this happens in response to toxins, uh, to cancer-causing agents, to viruses where DNA is directly damaged. And our body has this uh, amazing ability to deal with that, either to repair those cells and that DNA damage, or to discard those cells. If, however, those cells linger and are not taken care of, they can enter the promotion stage. And this promotion stage can last for years or decades. And this is where the cells proliferate, uh, they divide, and they can become cancerous. So they can accumulate the um, DNA mutations become genomically unstable. If you provide them with that correct growth environment, they can continue to divide, continue to grow, become um, apparent in the body as lumps or uh, affecting the function of the body. And then they can get to the stage where they go then into the progression phase where they actually obtain the ability to travel beyond the place where they started and travel to other organs in the body they can metastasize and that's your stage four cancer. Now in terms of lifestyle, we believe that the initiation and the promotion uh, stages are where lifestyle can be most impactful. And there really is not good evidence that lifestyle can affect the progression stage when you've got to that um, stage. Although there, there are anecdotal, uh, there is anecdotal evidence, there's about a thousand cases in the medical literature where you you can actually affect that stage. And there's a wonderful book called Radical Remission that actually looks specifically at that question. Um, but when we talk about lifestyle, it is the initiation and promotion stage. And in those stages, there are a number of mechanisms that contribute to DNA damage, provide that growth environment so cells continue to divide, can become cancer, and then can cause problems in the body. And if you could go to the next slide, Daniel. I'm sorry, George. Um, so here are the mechanisms that uh, are at play. And these mechanisms are interdependent. And you will also see that these are mechanisms that can also be um, occurring in other chronic diseases. There are common mechanisms in cancer and other chronic diseases. And I'll just speak to a few of them. So 
The first one, hormone dysregulation. So this is, uh, for example, when we eat a diet that, that is rich in animal foods, we may increase the estrogens in our body that may be important for cancers such as uh, breast cancer or endometrial cancer, which are driven by estrogen. This also relates to uh, insulin-like growth factor. And this is something that's very important in cancer development. And when we have a diet that is rich in animal foods, we see a real increase in insulin-like growth factor in our body. And that is a growth promoting hormone. And we know from studies that that is linked to increased risk, increased incidence of cancer. Uh, for example, there's also um, an, an amazing study that looks at a group of people who have a syndrome called Laron syndrome. And that syndrome has a genetic mutation that means that they have very low levels of insulin-like growth factor. And cancer is virtually unheard of in that population, as is diabetes. So the hormonal dysregulation, the growth factor dysregulation is important. Oxidative stress um, that can occur, you know, when carcinogens come into our body, this is when the body creates reactive oxygen species, free radicals that directly damage our DNA. Inflammation is a common pathway in many different uh, chronic diseases um, that can be uh, growth promoting. The microbiome, that's uh, very important as well. In the last 10 years, we've had um, a real growth in our understanding of the microbiome. And we know that the microbiome is, uh, that consists of trillions and trillions of microbes that sit on our body, in our body. And when we talk about microbiome in terms of cancer, we're really talking about the gut microbiome. Again, trillions of um, microbes within our gut that maintain the integrity of the gut lining that um, are in, integrally important in maintaining our immune system and other physiological processes. And we know that a healthy microbiome is one that has a diverse uh, amount of species of bacteria, that these bacteria are those that produce short chain fatty acids, which protect the, the cells of the bowel wall they um, provide energy to these cells, they prevent them from becoming cancerous and they play into the immune system as well. And the other really amazing thing uh, from recent research is that actually your microbiome can, the composition of your microbiome can predict your response to certain treatments, uh, specifically the immunotherapies which use your um, own uh, immune system to target cancer cells. And just last month, in fact, there was a small study that showed that um, people who had um, more short chain fatty acids in their stool, that is a sign of a, a healthy microbiome, had an increased response to their immunotherapy and an increased progression free survival. So this is a very exciting area. And we want to feed our gut microbiome fibers and resistant starches resistant starches being your whole grains and your, your legumes. And this promotes the gut um, microbiome to be healthy. Conversely, if you're feeding them animal foods, um, you are going to get increases in secondary bile acids, compounds that are directly carcinogenic to you. Uh, the next uh, one I have on the list is the immune function. A, a, a good functioning immune system is um, absolutely necessary to prevent cancer. Carcinogens, of course, if you're going to continue to put carcinogens in your body, like smoking, alcohol, other carcinogens, you're going to continue to get cumulative DNA damage. And then the final one I have on this uh, slide is dyslipidemia. There is evidence that, you know, if your lipids are high, your cholesterol, et cetera, they, they share common pathways and provide a growth promoting environment. So many, many mechanisms, they interplay within uh, each other as well. You know, I'm, I was very fascinated by what you're saying that, you know, your body can actually produce cancer cells, but if you're healthy, you can actually deal with the cancer cells from progressing. I think a lot of people don't realize that your body does produce cancer cells, but a healthy immune system can actually fight it off. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you're saying the last of factors is really the key here at these early stages. That's right. In the first two phases, you can impact that risk. Well, you know, uh, let's get into the nutrition aspect. You're talking a lot about nutrition. And of course, 
you and uh, Michelle really promote plant-based nutrition. And um, so I want to uh, read to our viewers here um, a statement from the International Agency uh, for Research on Cancer, which is an arm of the World Health Organization. Uh, they say here, processed meat was classified as carcinogenic to humans group one, based on sufficient evidence in humans that consumption of processed meat causes colorectal cancer. Then later on, they say that red meat is a probable carcinogen to humans group 2A. So this means cancer causing. So processed meat is definite cancer causing. Uh, red meat is probably cancer causing, which is probably not, was not that great either. So can you explain to our listeners like, so what is about these hamburgers and sausages and things like that? Like what, how do these things cause cancer? I don't think a lot of people make that link. So as you say, 2015, the World Health Organization did declare processed meat as a class one carcinogen. That means that based on their review of the literature, which was around 800 study, uh, studies, um, they determined that there was sufficient evidence that this causes bowel cancer. So no doubt this is in the same category as smoking, as asbestos, as plutonium. They're absolutely sure that there is this link. Mm -hmm. And uh, red meat is the probably causing uh, bowel cancer. And there are several features of processed meat and red meat which may contribute to this uh, cancer causing mechanism. So in processed meat, for example, you have nitrites, nitrates uh, in the body. They are in the, in the bowel, in fact, they are converted to N-nitroso compounds which are directly uh, carcinogenic. They, they cause the, can the colon cells to become uh, carcinogenic. They promote an oxidative state and inflammation. Uh, the second uh, thing about red meat and processed meat is the heme component of it, the heme iron component. And heme iron is known to be pro-oxidant. It creates these uh, free radicals that cause DNA damage. Um, and uh, heme iron is mainly found in red meat, but it's also found in, in other meats as well. And then uh, other aspects um, of processed meat would be the saturated fat content, which is linked to cancer, uh, the protein content, which is uh, linked to cancer, and also the um, uh, in the cooking methods, when you cook these meats, you actually um, cause compounds such as heterocyclic amines, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are carcinogenic. And these are in the red meats and the processed meats and other meats as well, of course. Yeah, it's kind of scary that to think that, you know, when the, by what we're putting in our mouth, we actually, we could be putting agents in our mouth, agents in our body that actually could trigger the, uh, the DNA damage and so forth that's causing cancer. Exactly. It's and not just genetic, is it? Absolutely, yes. And just, um, just following on from what we said about the processed meat, I didn't mention that the combination of processed meat and uh, red meat causes 20% of all our bowel cancers. So that means an additional 5,000 people in Canada every year will be diagnosed with bowel cancer because of eating these, um, these meats. So, so how, absolutely. But how about uh, like chicken and fish? You know, these are often considered... Um healthier, maybe uh, you and uh, maybe Michelle wants to get into this as well. You know, these are white meat, they're a little bit healthier supposedly. So what are your thoughts? Um, in terms of, you know, it's important to talk about, like Zara was talking about the barbecuing, especially as we enter the season and we're at home <laughs> and cooking, um, even cooking and um, grilling the, the chicken and the fish is still problematic. It's those high temperatures of grilling that's gonna cause the problem. And many people feel like, well, I need to eat the fish for the omega-3, but it's really the fish are eating the omega-3. It's not that the fish themselves have it. So we don't even need to consume the fish to do that. And all animal products um, contribute to the high cholesterol. And that is one of the risk factors that Zara pointed out at the previous slide, um, having a high cholesterol profile and having that inflammation can definitely lead to, to cancer. So there's so many benefits of not choosing the chicken and fish, even though they've been deemed more healthier animals um, to consume. There's so many things we can do with plant-based nutrition um, that gets us everything we need um, without the risk factor in it. I guess when we say it's healthier, healthier compared to what, right? I guess yeah, exactly. It's people are trying to hang on to this notion that they can still eat what they always have or their family have in the past. And they don't realize there's so many other things we can eat. 
and have no deficiencies and be healthy and know that we're reducing our risk for cancer and other cardiovascular disease. Right. Michelle, staying with you, um, how about dairy? Yeah, dairy is a big topic. Um, definitely with the World um, Cancer Research Fund that you brought in as well, there's a lot of evidence that it is linked to prostate cancer as well as uh, breast cancer as well. Um, a thing too important to remember that Zara mentioned earlier on is this hormone insulin, insulin growth factor um, that definitely plays a role in uh, the proliferation of the cells that uh, Zara showed in that first slide. And also it's important to remember that dairy uh, has a lot of unnecessary saturated fat. And those fats that we're eating from animal products are contributing to higher inflammation, to raising our cholesterol, leading to strokes, um, heart attack, heart disease, um, and obesity, of course, which is a major risk factor for so many cancers. So dairy has been linked to so many um, types of different cancers, and especially um, those who are lactose intolerant, there's a risk for lung, breast, uh, breast and ovarian cancer as well. Um, there was a study that was done um, in 2015 that looked at over 22,000 people and compared them with lactose intolerant compared to other families who consumed dairy. And the people who consumed dairy in the family definitely showed a higher risk of cancer and, and evidence of that as well. Um, so people can think of like smoking, alcohol, drugs as these risky things, but I think dairy is in those risky uh, things as well and animal fats. Uh, people don't realize that that is just as dangerous and sometimes even more because people are consuming it and they think, oh, well, I didn't smoke today or I, stopped, I quit smoking, but they're eating hot dogs and eating all these processed cheese and that is just as dangerous. Right, right. And, and we don't need uh, dairy to, to be healthy, do we? No, absolutely not. There's so many other plant-based foods that um, you can have that contains calcium like broccoli and okra uh, soy, um, it's just endless. And um, even the Canada's Food Guide, now that I know we're gonna talk about it in a little bit, does promote uh, before there was a whole dairy section in the rainbow and now you don't even see it anymore. Right, right. Yeah, right there. And I don't know how many of our viewers have seen this. I'm so thankful to see something new because I've been looking at the same one since 1970, who knows what. And I'm so happy that this one is definitely using the research that's out there um, to promote that plant-based is really the way to eat. And if you look at the plate, um, it did include uh, the protein foods. You do see that it has a little bit of meat there and egg, but the majority now is all plant-based. Whether if you remember the rainbow um, food guide, there was no tofu on there, no nuts. It was just something off to the side. Meat was the major focus and you probably always heard the commercial saying, oh, meat's the main star of the plate and the vegetables just decorate it. And now it's completely switched around as you can see in the food guide. Um, and how they also have here choosing water as your drink of choice. I'm so happy to see that because before regular fruit juice and concentrated sugar was on there all the time. And I used to counsel um, young children and their families and trying to get them off of the juice. And milk is not in there either, all these um, milk programs are being pushed at school. It's not necessary to have that extra fat um, and especially all the saturated fat when you have all those glorious other items on that plate. Mm -hmm. so it's a really a great step in the right direction. And I think especially for the patients that Zara and I see, it's great for them to see the visual of this plate and to show that Canada as, as a country is, is moving towards the right direction. And it's all evidence-based, so it's not, not like other people who may be listening and wondering if um, this is just something that we promote, Zara and I alone. It's not. It's definitely evidence-based, and um, we see it all the time at work, um, how many people benefit from doing this. Now, you know, I think uh, people might push back a little bit. I'm going to show you something here. Um, here. This is from the World Cancer Research Fund report. And in this report, I'm gonna read it for our, our viewers here. It says, if you eat red meat, limit consumption to no more than about three portions per week. Red meat is a good source of protein, iron, and other micronutrients. For those who consume it lean rather than fatty cuts, this recommendation is not to completely avoid eating meat. Meat can be a valuable source of nutrients and da 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 da. However, eating meat is not an essential part of a healthy diet. So, you know, um, here, 
they're saying, you know, limit it, but um, uh, we in lifestyle medicine, we promote eliminating it. And uh, I, I presume that scientists and uh, experts put together this report and you folks are really well versed as well. So people are, are, can be confused. So, you know, why not limit? Why, have to, why do we have to go quote unquote extreme and just cut everything out? Okay, sure. Um, before I say my answer, I think Zara's muted and she might want to jump into to talk. <laughs> um, you know, it's very interesting. People have the idea and, you know, I have been plant-based. I'm the only one in my family. Okay, everybody, everyone else thought I was nuts in the 80s and just left me alone. And my poor family thought I was going to die of malnutrition and I'm still alive. Um, and what's important to know is that people say, well, if you don't have meat, then you're not going to have protein and then you're going to be sick, and then you're going to be malnourished. But actually, uh, tofu, and I'm just reading this so I get this correctly for you guys, that tofu has three milligrams more of the non-heme iron than a serving of red meat. And all the beans and legumes that we eat, I'm pretty sure that I'm eating way more protein than my crazy meat-eating family. Um, and I, and I, you know, to be, to be honest with you guys, I have never been low in hemoglobin or protein or any of this my entire life, I do not take any supplement except for B12 because that's the one thing that I, it's difficult for vegans to get to. But I can honestly say there's no other um, vitamin. And of course, vitamin D, as you can tell, I'm not very tanned. Um, we never go outside. <laughs> um, but you don't need to have um, red meat um, to do that. And, you know, Zara and I, and I'm sure, sure, sure that Zara can jump in on this, when our patients are making the transition, or if any of you here online are listening and you're meat eaters, we're not saying you have to go cold turkey or leave everything behind and shame yourself for eating something. Every transition, every change you make little by little and replace that meat for something plant-based protein, you're making a better choice. So I don't like to say personally as a dietitian, it's an all or nothing because I don't want to lose you guys. I'm willing to work with you and to try to make a a happy medium and slowly, slowly, you know, you'll start to realize that you feel better. That's what our patients say. When they eat plant-based, they feel more energetic. They feel better. Even if they're undergoing radiation and chemotherapy, they feel better. Um, and I'm sure Zara can, can contest that too, seeing that live every day at work. Indeed. Yeah. I echo everything you've said. And uh, absolutely. There's so much data to link um, animal foods to all our chronic diseases, the diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. And so, and as you said, it's completely unnecessary. So to us, yes, eliminating it is probably best. Now, if you're having a plant-based diet that is 90% um, plant-based and you have a little bit of animal products, we don't have the data to say that that's not going to be very healthy. That probably is going to be very healthy, but you are exposing yourself. You're, to the bad things that we know are in meat, the saturated fat, the persistent organic pollutants, the carcinogens, all those things that we've just talked about. And it's completely unnecessary. So I also, and as Michelle advocate ultimately to, to just ditch it completely. And if you're worried about the environment as well, uh, not only for the environment by itself, but the effect of climate change on us as individuals, the uh, effects of having pandemics caused by uh, animal agriculture, there's so much more to it than just our individual nutritional health. Well, I guess the uh, the key line here is the is the last line. It says, however, eat, eating meat is not essential, part of healthy. So it's like, do you want to take carcinogens or not? I guess, uh, kind of what kind of nutrition do you want? Do you want optimal or do you want less than optimal? I guess that's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of um, physicians and other healthcare professionals may be unfamiliar or uneducated on, like you really don't need to have any animal products to be healthy. I've counseled many women who are going through pregnancy who their um, obstetricians have been trying to talk them out of being plant-based, thinking that they're not gonna have a healthy pregnancy or healthy outcome, which is completely not true, or raising children as plant-based. Um, there's a sense of malnutrition that they feel that's gonna happen um, when they see their pediatrician, but it's, you can totally have a healthy diet and I think get more rich uh, omega-3 and richer fats and healthier proteins than eating uh, meat. Right, I think what you're saying totally makes sense. It's a good balanced approach. 
Um, so let's leave uh, meat alone for a bit and let's switch to plants. So uh, we, I think everyone knows that plants are beneficial. Uh, most people know that plant is plants are good, but why though? Uh, maybe Michelle, can you take a stab at this one? Sure. Um, often I get this, asked this question on a daily basis and the importance of plants in general, even if you're not completely plant-based or thinking of transitioning or still including animal products, is that the benefit of the fiber that these plants and the legumes offer. It helps with colorect you know, colorectal cancer, having good fiber. The studies show that those who have more fiber have less risk factor. Um, of course, um, cholesterol is another one. Uh, stroke and heart disease, having a good amount of insoluble fiber and soluble fiber is really key to a healthy microbiome that Zara was speaking about. Mm -hmm. The difference between the two is easy to think about is that insoluble fiber helps move things along in your gut. So it doesn't linger in there. It helps get rid of the waste and keeps you regular, which is extremely important. I talk about bowel movements all the time at work and um, it's, it really is such an important um, of our daily uh, daily ritual, people don't realize how important it is. And soluble fiber really helps collect all those bad things that are left in our gut and help eliminate them. It also helps with feeling full and the sense of satiety. And that's really going to help achieve your weight loss goals. You know, after now it's been 20 years of me being a dietitian, people have looked at all types of things to lose weight, low fat, look at your calories, look at all these things in the label, but really the key to weight loss is fiber. The more fiber we have, and that's at least 25 to 50 grams a day, is really gonna be helpful for weight loss, to feel satisfied, and also help reduce our risk for other comorbidities. So really plants, I think, are, are so much more than just getting your micronutrients of getting some vitamin C or A or K or zinc. It's really the fiber that's the most important thing, I think, that the plants offer. And it's not hard to get fiber on a plant-based nutrition, is it? Oh, absolutely not. And a lot of people feel like, oh, how can I eat all this stuff? But you know what? You're going to get so full on these delicious um, plant-based foods or even making a smoothie if you want to and, and putting in and like chia seeds or putting in um, hemp hearts and you get all this extra great fiber. So you feel full, like you don't feel like you're missing something and it's going to help you feel full for longer and also help your blood sugars be more stable which is so key to other risk factors. If your blood sugar is all over the place, you're going to more likely want to crave those sugars or those extra snacks, which lead to the extra weight, which is what we don't want. Right. And excess weight is a risk factor for cancer. Am I correct? Absolutely. And um, there's so many cancers, especially if I speak to breast cancer. Um, if you look at the evidence of, of reoccurrence, if women can get their BMI as low as possible, but I must mention not to be overweight, uh, underweight, because underweight also has its own health issues. But having your BMI as low as possible, so that's um, under the age of 65, between 18.5 and 25. And if you go on um, the Health Canada website, it can help you calculate your BMI. Um, this is the, the risk factor that's going to lower your risk of reoccurrence, as well as activity, exercise, lower um, alcohol intake, of course, stress, I think, plays a huge factor, and of course, plant-based. But weight plays a huge role, and I think people don't give it enough credit. Um, of course, you think of lung cancer, you think of smoking, and you know, if, you, if I don't smoke, then I'm fine. But if I'm 300 pounds and don't smoke, you're still not fine. So it's a whole combination of a whole lifestyle approach. Right. And uh, uh, getting more specific, Dr. Zara, um, this is a question that I get often as well. So, you know, plant-based is great and phytochemicals, antioxidants, blah, blah, all that stuff. But how about like soy um, when it comes to breast cancer? This is a question that I think comes up a lot. Uh, how about soy? Is soy okay? And maybe, Michelle, you can chime in as well if you want. So absolutely, soy is beneficial. There's absolutely no doubt. And it's not only breast cancer that it's been shown to be beneficial in. I'll come back to breast cancer in a minute. But uh, there's prostate cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, and colon cancer studies in each of these uh, sites. For example, in prostate cancer, um, there was a meta-analysis that looked at um, about 14 different uh, studies and showed that if you had um, soy intake, a good soy intake, you reduced your risk of prostate cancer by 26%. So uh, it is in other cancers as well, but going back to your question on breast cancer, of course, the um, concern has uh, come from the 
fact that soy has phytoestrogens, this class of uh, phytoestrogens called isoflavones, that people were concerned would act like an estrogen, like, an, like a human estrogen in the body and promote breast cancer. And in fact, interestingly, they're less concerned about the estrogens that come from animals, which actually do mimic estrogen in our body. But the estrogen from soy um, actually acts on a different receptor. It, it acts on the estrogen beta receptors and they have a different effect uh, on the breast tissue. And so now we've had multiple, multiple studies showing that those people who have a higher soy intake have a lower incidence of breast cancer. And that benefit comes mainly from eating soy in adolescents. Um, and that reduction in risk, that is in premenopausal cancers, postmenopausal cancers, hormone positive cancers, hormone negative cancers. And then if you have a diagnosis of breast cancer, again, multiple studies and meta-analyses uh, showing that you can reduce your risk of getting breast cancer back again in the order of 20 to 30% uh, reduction risk of recurrence and dying from breast cancer if you are eating uh, soy regularly. And again, that's for hormone positive and for hormone negative breast cancers, suggesting that it's not just the estrogen mechanism that is at play here. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just add in to Zara, um, what's important is the photo that everyone you see here, that is the, the right way that I want you to be eating soy or even through um, with edamame. What, what we say that we, that we don't promote is those processed soy, um, you know, everyone's, I'm, I'm happy that everyone's showing plant-based burgers and these type of um, veggie ground round and those fake hot dogs, but all those things have so much sodium in it and extra processed foods that sometimes people say, well, I'm eating all this stuff, isn't it healthy? So it's, it's better than you're not eating meat, but we can do even better and reduce that salt intake, which is also linked to a cardiovascular disease, stroke, um, blood pressure issues. So how um, you see it in the photo here and making it in its true form and soy milk or edamame, these are the better choices of soy than those processed packaged things. And yeah. interestingly, those, those soy products, they actually, when you eat them, these highly concentrated soy products, they, your body, um, you can show increases in insulin-like growth factor, which we've already talked about as being growth promoting. So even though it's, from a plant-based source, uh, you still have to be careful. And Michelle and I look at these as transition foods, these you know highly processed soy products, rather than what you actually want in a big way in your diet on an ongoing basis. Yeah, you know, as a Korean, you know, a mom used to just get rice and then just to put uh, soybeans in there, then cook it with the, you know, no processing, just eat it whole, yeah. Rice, so. Yeah, and that, that's how we do it home. And even though um, my daughter is a meat eater, she is, thinking her mother is right in some ways. And I do do, you know, just like you said, I make the rice or I do a stir fry with all these fresh vegetables and just put the tofu in as its natural form. And it's so great. And everyone feels full and satisfied and not missing something out, I guess, if they did ribs on the barbecue. Right, right. Before we get to questions, just one quick uh, other question here. So are there, would you, uh, do you want to highlight specific fruits or vegetables that you kind of see as like really key here or, or do you just, doesn't matter? Uh, like, are there just some that really stand out? Well, you know, like, like Zara and I mentioned, we are happy if anyone's trying to use different fruits and vegetables and legumes into their diet. I'm looking for ones that have good nutritional value, good color to them. So you can always think of, think of the word go for your plate. There's a G for all the green uh, vegetables you can put on and O for anything orange. And that's something easy for you to look at your plate and something to incorporate with your children and get them involved in the kitchen. You can say, is there, is there go on our plate? Can, are we ready to go? So they'll know is that there's something green and, and broccoli, like I mentioned, has really good calcium, has great fiber, okra, onions have great benefits, garlic and um, the orange peppers and all these great um, things you can ask your kids to go and pick up something new at the grocery store or now order groceries online and pick something new they never tried and make sure they have that go on the plate at all times. And, and really Zara and I are so happy that people are trying to incorporate new things into their plate. Um, always have a salad there, 
But um, you know, if it's we don't want iceberg lettuce, I would prefer something like kale or dark green bean spinach. But I'm happier picking the iceberg over, let's say, potato chips. <laughs> so we're flexible when we're trying to help families transition. All right, all right. Well, uh, we're gonna get to some questions if that's okay. Um, and then at the end, we'll tie up some loose ends here. Um, so I'm just gonna say your name and then just the question. Um, so if I do not say your name properly. So we have an uh, admin here. Uh, so you talked about like grilling uh, meat and things like that, but how about grilled veggies? Yeah, so when I grill vegetables, um, how I do it is it's the high temperatures that's the problem. And you don't want that charring to occur on the vegetables either. So when you marinate them, so either I marinate them in like a healthy olive oil or avocado oil, because the avocado oil has a higher melting point, so it's a safer oil to cook with. I put some lemon, lime, you know, whatever um, herbs you want. I bake it in the oven first, so I get most of the cooking done on it. And then I put it on the grill at a lower temperature, just if you want that taste. But definitely marinating it is a safer way to, to do that as well. So that would be my suggestion. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, we have another question here from TD. And um, the question is, I think we lack knowledge of what to substitute meat with. What legumes and portion will be enough protein source? Basically, so like, how do we know we're getting enough protein? And how okay, we that, that's a great question. So how I try to help my patients um, visualize it, because none of us know the grams of what we should have, and you're not all calculating your body weight and protein needs. So if you use the palm of your hand as your guide, because we always have our hands with us, you could take it anywhere. So this size over here, um, every palm of your hand is roughly about 20, 21 grams of protein. So if we had beans and lentils in here and tofu in here, these are options um, that you can see how much you need. And the average person on average needs about two to three palms of your hand a day. So this is how you can help. Everyone's different in terms of what your health needs are, because I, I calculated very specifically to my patients, um, you know, other issues that are going on with them. But basically, that's a true way for you to figure out if you're getting enough. Just use your hand. Right, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I would say that, you know, people are, are very concerned about the protein issue, but they really don't need to be. You, your protein needs are extremely low, five to 10% of your diet only. Um, and, you know, as Neil Barnardo says from PCRM, that you could have a plate, 2000 calories of broccoli every day, and you would get, you would meet your protein needs. Yeah. Um, you, exactly. every, every vegetable has protein in it. You really don't need to worry. Michelle and I just don't worry anymore. <laughs> on average, the average person only needs 0.8 grams of protein for every kilo they weigh. So if you know how much you weigh, it's really just 0 0.8 grams. It's so small. And I think people focus too much on protein and they're not paying any attention to fiber, which is really, it's going to be your savior of the fiber for so many different illnesses. Well, there's very few people in the hospital due to lack of protein, I guess. <laughs> yes. Um, now, this is a very interesting question. Again, it's from TD and if you decide to go plant-based, do you have to select organic foods instead of GMO, GMO, plant-based foods, any risk factors? Question. So basically organic GMO, your thoughts? Yeah. So, um, you know, intuitively, one would think that organic is better. We know that there are pesticides such as glyphosate, malathione, uh, diazinon. These have all been classified as probable carcinogens by the World Health Organization. So, so just by common sense, it, it seems a good thing to do. And um, recently, there have been two studies. Uh, one is the Nutrinet uh, Santi study. Uh, the other one is the Million Dollar, Billion Dollar, Million Women's uh, study. Um, the Nutrinet Santi study um, had had uh, thousands of uh, patients in it, and they looked at that specific question, and they found that people who were eating more organic foods had lower risks of certain types of cancers, such as the lymphomas and such as uh, breast cancer. That study showed a reduction in the risk of breast cancer as well. The Million Women study showed a reduction in uh, lymphomas. It didn't show a reduction in breast cancer. And I think the most evidence is around the reduction in lymphomas. And probably people will know uh, that uh, there have been several lawsuits against Monsanto and their glyphosate um, pesticide in, in causing 
non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So there definitely is a link. So if you can, it's always better to go organic. We understand that there are you know, factors that might prevent you from getting organic. And the Environmental Working Group has a list of the um, clean 15. So these are you know, the best um, fruits and vegetables to choose and then the dirty dozen which have the most pesticides. So you know, we don't want to say you, you shouldn't have fruits and vegetables if they're not organic. Uh, because obviously having that is is way more beneficial and you'll get way more, uh, way less, I beg your pardon, pesticides and persistent organic pollutants from having non-organic veg, uh, fruit and veg than you would from having meat, in fact. So, but do look up the uh, environmental working groups, Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen. Yeah, and I often tell my patients too uh, that they worry about the financial aspect of organic versus not. And you know, Zara and I are not um, unaware that it's it's difficult to do your entire grocery shopping organic. Um, so you want to use that list that Zara mentioned, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15, to make your choices and selection, and also what suits your family, both um, you know health wise and also financially. But you can pick a lot of things. I think a lot of the grocery stores, in my opinion, even if I think of the chains that are not normally known for organic, are definitely carrying organic now at better prices. So I, I think that's I think that's a whole shift that's happening too, George. Mm -hmm. Now this is a very interesting question. Uh, this is directed to you, Dr. Kasam. So Richard uh, Harry Chuck says, "Diet as prevention of chronic disease and cancer. Are you aware of the critical age for intervention?" So it's like, is there a critical age? And he says here, for example, I recall a study in which smoking cessation is a benefit at any age, but age thirty was critical. So cancer does develop over many years, right? If we go, if we move to a plant-based diet, you can see immediate benefits for things like your triglycerides and your um, your bad cholesterol and your your glucose control. You can see immediate benefits in in those aspects of our health. For cancer, um, definitely, you're looking at a much longer period of time where cancer develops. However, you know, I don't think there's any time where it's not valuable to go plant-based even from a cancer point of view there's not definite studies looking at that exact question but if we look at um, the studies for people who have cancer already um, you know some people might argue that that's too late now to institute these lifestyle measures we absolutely know that there are studies that have been done that show that what ever um, age you are diagnosed in that cohort and their studies looking at colorectal cancer, prostate cancer um, and breast cancer in that setting, that you can reduce the risk of, re of, of those cancers coming back and the risk, reduce the risks of dying of cancer. So absolutely we would say, no, it's never too late. Um, and these risks of cancer coming back, that, that happens within months to to years, one, two years, that happens immediately, you know, in very short space of time after your cancer diagnosis, you can have your cancer back. So the fact that you can impact that even once you've got a cancer diagnosis, that tells me that you it's never too late. And, you know, it's worth mentioning some of those studies actually, because they're, they're, they're amazing. And although most of the evidence is in cancer prevention, these are, these are very um, good studies that have been done. One of them was published just last month. It was the uh, study um, looking at breast cancer and it uh, looked at 48,000 postmenopausal women. It was the Women's Health Initiative study and it was a randomized control study and one group had a standard diet, the other group had more fruits, more vegetables, more whole grains, low fat. And that group, if you developed cancer, you had a lower risk of dying from cancer. So that means you can change your risk even after having a cancer diagnosis. The other big study that everybody quotes is Dean Ornish's study from 2005, where he took a group of patients with early stage prostate cancer who had chosen surveillance rather than you know, radiation or surgery. And he randomized them to um, lifestyle changes, i.e. a primarily plant-based diet, stress management, exercise, and the other group got just standard of care. And after one year on average, your, their PSA levels were lower. PSA is a marker in the blood which monitors the activity of uh, prostate cancer. And in the group that didn't have that intervention, the P 
PSA went, went up. So you can see that actually changing your lifestyle behaviors actually does have an impact in a short space of time. That was that one year you saw that benefit. And the other really interesting thing, and I think that this does relate to this question, it sounds like I'm going off on a, a tangent, but uh, Dean Ornish um, actually did the study on a separate group of prostate cancer patients. He did prostate biopsies before and three months after these lifestyle intervention changes. And he saw, um, he looked at gene expression and after three months only of doing these lifestyle changes, he saw that you can turn on tumor suppressor genes and you can turn off tumor promoting genes. Three months, that's within three months. So it's never too late. That's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. That you can like do gene switching. Yeah, you can change the expression of your genes by changing your lifestyle in a very short space of time, it seems. Oh, wow, we have so many questions coming in. I'm, I'm going to apologize to people before, beforehand. We're not going to get to everyone, but there's a few questions that came in about oil. So I don't think I'm going to address that because it seems like different people have questions on the same thing here. Um, so is cooking with oil healthy? Um, does oil become carcinogenic when heated up? How about olive oil? You know, that kind of stuff. So is oil healthy? What are your thoughts? Very quickly. Uh, sure. So quickly, the less oil you use, the better. Um, so you can definitely cook with um, water, which I know that sounds crazy, but you can totally stir fry with adding some water and then you add all the fresh herbs um, that you want. But uh, avocado oil has a, a better, higher temperature from burning. So it's a better oil to cook with. I wouldn't cook with olive oil. I would use it more as uh, a dressing on my salad or to marinate things. Like I said before, I was going to barbecue them. But avocado is a safe oil. Canola is another healthy oil that's a healthy fat oil. But the less you use the oil, the better it's going to be in terms of um, your, even though it's healthy fat, it's still fat. So that's my little quick thing. Okay. Uh, last question to both of you. Um, this is coming from Chris Bautista. Thank you for the question. So this is very actually a very interesting question. So if someone has had cancer in the past and they've done treatments, I, I, I'm assuming they got better. Do you suggest the same things as to prevention? So as if they've never had cancer or do they have to do extra? Do you want I, to go first? Or? <laughs> <laughs> sure, so absolutely we, we would recommend uh, exactly the same. So mostly plant-based diet, exercise, maintain a good healthy uh, weight, um, minimize other carcinogens such as, uh, or eliminate really tobacco, alcohol, processed foods, absolutely reduce your processed foods. There is now data suggesting that for every 10% increase in processed foods you have, there's a 10% increased risk of cancer. Um, so all those recommendations, and, and perhaps George, you could put up uh, in a second all the, uh, the nine recommendations from the international cancer community. But I would say, you know, specifically to that question, that somebody who's already had cancer, you might consider that that person may be more pre predisposed to cancer or not, that's unclear, but certainly, unfortunately, the cancer treatments that we use, um, whether it's chemotherapy, whether it's radiation treatment, can increase one's risk of new cancers forming in the body. And they do come with other long-term side effects such as heart disease. So if you have chemotherapy that affects your heart or radiation in that area that can affect your heart, actually these recommendations to me are doubly important because you have other risk factors that might increase your risk of chronic diseases and, and new cancers. And, you know, here, I love this slide and we've circled the nutrition piece of it because of course that's our favorite uh, part of this, but these nine recommendations um, are good for people who are trying to prevent cancer, but also who are uh, have had a cancer diagnosis in the past. And that's all the things that we've said um, already. And we've said, we the only things we haven't mentioned perhaps are, um, limiting the consumption of sugar sweetened drinks, which can promote obesity and metabolic syndrome. Um, don't use super nutritional doses of supplements because there's no evidence that that prevents cancer. Um, and at the end, you can see the last one on the list says after a cancer diagnosis, follow our recommendations as well. Michelle? Yeah, so, um, you know, as this uh, little diagram shows, it's circled there eating uh, plant-based and whole rich, um, 
grains and fruits and vegetables, but also the physical activity aspect is so key and important for heart health and also your mental well being. Um, you know, the Zara just mentioned, and we were talking just before we went on um, about not taking extra, extra supplements. And I say extra, extra because all my patients say, should I take like triple the dose of vitamin C now or should I do this? But as we were mentioning before, our body is so smart and so efficient. You spending extra money on taking three multivitamins a day, I'm sorry to say, but you're just going to pee out what you don't need. <laughs> Your body takes what it needs. So if we treat our body well and give it what it wants, which is the exercise, a good body weight, uh, help with stress reduction and reduce those carcinogens, then I would want to trust my own body and, and, and know that I don't have to take all these extra supplements by mouth when I don't really need to. But nothing replaces a healthy lifestyle, I guess. Nothing does. And I know everyone wants this quick answer, you know, like how do I lose 20 pounds really quick? Well, it didn't come on really quick. So you're not going to lose it really quick. So we just need to really just be gentle with ourselves. And I, and I think especially during this time, and I'm sure a lot of you here on screen can contest to this too, that this pandemic and staying home has really, you know, been kind of a good thing to kind of slow down and realize what the priorities are and to try to do some self-care and then I think if we just try to think of something positive out of this pandemic, that's something that hopefully you've done some more cooking skills, spend more time with your family, laugh, try to do get some exercise. And that's really what's going to be helpful. Last, last thing before we close up here, um, just very quickly, you know, someone's listening to this. They say that, you know, that you, 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 uh, it kind of makes, it makes sense. I want to do this, but they say it sounds very hard. Uh, any words of encouragement to close off here? Sure. It's, it's not hard as it sounds, you know, you're going to go slow and just try to implement a few things. We're so lucky now that we have the internet and there's like a million recipes at your disposal. And even if you try one or two days or one or two meals a week, you know, we, we eat about like 40, 50 times a week. So even if you make 10 of them amazing, that's amazing. And then you'll, every week you'll get better and it's not complicated you know, my husband, who is a total meat eater, says that my vegetarian cooking is way more tastier than his boring old meat. So if I can win him over, all of you listening and your family can totally do it. <laughs> Dr. Zara? Totally. The, the resources available, there's, there's everything you need out there. Um, there's people around you to help, people like yourself. Um, and it's really important actually to, to keep in mind why you're doing it. So if you can attach emotionally to what your why is, whether that's, I want to be around longer to be with my children and grandchildren. If you keep remembering that, you'll stay on track. Right. Yeah. And I would get your children involved in your grandkids because they want to help out and they love to be in the kitchen and it's a great bonding time. Well, thank you so much. You know, today we talked about cancer, which is really critical. And, you know, it's, it's, it's encouraging to know that there's something at least we can do. Um, it's not 100% guaranteed, but there's powerful things that we can do in terms of lifestyle. I think that should be encouraging to every one of us. So thanks, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zara and Michelle for taking your time to speak with the group here. Uh, they both practice at the Stronic Cancer Center in Newmarket, so you can check them out. They're also on social media. And so you can follow them uh, via social media as well. And again, we want to uh, highlight their uh, organization, Plant Based Canada. Keep an eye out. Um, uh, and you can actually go on the website and sign up for the email list to stay up to date on things. We also want to thank Lifestyle Medicine, the not for profit organization that's putting this on, and also Pathways Clinic. If you want a uh, naturopathic lifestyle medicine support, we can be definitely uh, do that for you. And uh, we just want to thank. Um, you the guests for coming for taking time off your Sunday to be here of course this would not be half as interesting if you weren't here so thanks so much and we hope that you really learned something if you are plant-based already then we really need you to go out and start sharing these things with other people because uh, this is the way we're going to get the message out we also have, we, we're keeping uh, keep on doing these webinars the next one we have is this Thursday with Dr. Caudill Esselstyn talking about heart disease and how to reverse heart disease so thanks so much, uh, Dr. Zara and Michelle and everyone for uh, coming, taking your time and uh, uh, God bless each one of you. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks Thank so you. much, George. Thank you, everybody.